Welcome to OECD Podcast, where policy meets people. Young people increasingly prioritize pursuing careers with positive social and environmental impacts. Globally, two in five young people see social impact as one of the deciding factors for their career choices. At the same time, almost half of young people in OECD countries would prefer to be self-employed rather than work as employees. Young people are seizing opportunities and leading many social enterprises across the world. Up to 20% of leadership positions in social enterprises in the province of Quebec in Canada, France and Spain are filled by young people and more than one in four social entrepreneurs and almost two in five aspiring social entrepreneurs in Australia, the United States and Western Europe are below the age of 34. In our recent OECD report on the potential of youth-led social enterprises, we argue that this type of enterprises can help young people to turn these aspirations into a dual opportunity to engage in entrepreneurship and generate positive social impact. I'm Natalie Lechelt and you're listening to OECD Podcast. Today, we are happy to be here with Polly Akerst, the co-founder and executive director of Amala. Welcome, Polly. We would love to hear a little bit more about your own story. How old were you when you founded Amala and how would you describe the idea for Amala was conceived? What, what does Amala do and what are the main impacts? Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can start by saying that um, I was definitely one of the young people uh, that you speak about in the report who were wanting to pursue uh, a career that would have a social and environmental impact. Um, I was 28 years old when I when I co-founded Amala, um, as was my co-founder Mia. Um, but I had obviously been interested in working in social innovation for a long time. Uh, so Mia and myself, we had both been working in the in education. Um, we worked for several years for an organization called UWC, which stands for United World Colleges, uh, which offers a transformative education uh, to young people from a whole variety of backgrounds and nationalities with a focus on creating peace and the sustainable future. Um, and as part of that, um, we did some work with refugee youth, um, mainly around refugee youth receiving scholarships. Uh, and we realized um, and we were exposed to the enormous barriers that refugee youth around the world face in accessing really high quality education. Um, and so that is what inspired us to set up Amala and to somewhat bravely, or some people might say foolishly, uh, leave our jobs and become social entrepreneurs. Uh, so a little bit more about Amala. Um, we have an expertise in enabling displaced young people to access education that can transform both their lives, but also their communities and the world as well. Um, and we have three different kind of areas of work. Um, so we have change maker courses, uh, which are non-formal education offerings that enable refugee youth to develop their sense of agency in key areas that relate to their lives. So um, some of the courses that we do are in ethical leadership, social entrepreneurship, funnily enough, <laughs> very relevant today, and peace building as well. Um, and then we also have a high school diploma program, which enables out of school refugee youth aged 16 to 25 to have a second opportunity to finish their, their high school education. Um, and we're currently running that in Kenya and Jordan. Um, and then the third thing we do is work with other organizations to develop bespoke programs using our agency based education model. Um, and so to date, we've reached over 2000 refugee and host community youth, and we want to grow that to 5000 over just over the next year and then um, scale beyond that as well. Uh, and I would say we have an increasing amount of evidence that accessing the Amala model of learning enables our students to address issues in their communities, access further education opportunities, and in some cases, even set up their own social enterprises. Um, so I think I'm coming to this discussion with, with several different lenses. I'm thinking about my own journey as a social entrepreneur, but also the, jo the journeys of the students that we work with um, and the work that we do in social entrepreneurship education as well. Wow, that's impressive. Thanks so much, Polly. Um, I think that this approach with the multiple lenses is very interesting. But overall, what we've seen and hope that you can illustrate a little bit more from your own experience is that the research indicates that uh, young social entrepreneurs face something that we are calling a double bind. This double bind is associated with the age of their founders and the specific char characteristics that social enterprises have. 
um, it can amplify challenges that young social entrepreneurs face, particularly related to the access of funding and financing, the knowledge and skills that they have to have, starting from social emotional skills to business skills and others, and then also navigating legal frameworks that are often complex and complicated and require additional assistance. And then finally, the question of visibility, like are there efforts and their impacts being seen by a public and by larger. So in, in all of that respect, what we wanted to hear from you is like, what do you think were the most important challenges you faced when you founded Amala? It's a really good question. And as I was reading through the report, I was, you know, I, so much of what you have written has really resonated and thinking, yes, this captures the exact dilemma that we were in or something that I thought about a lot. Um, so yeah, starting maybe from the, the kind of the youth piece, I think, we definitely experienced the youth discrimination bias. Um, and I would say that it was kind of even heightened by the fact that we were also two reasonably young women. Um, and so we had some incidents, particularly in the beginning when we were setting things up, where um, in particular, I would say older men would refer to us as girls. Um, and then I would say also, I mean, you highlight it in the report, but um trying to marry the social impact with with financial sustainability. Um, I think all the time you're, as a social entrepreneur, you're trying to figure out how to make the most social impact, but then also trying to work out how that can be financially sustainable. Um, and that isn't always simple. And those two things don't always run alongside each other. I think another thing that really resonated with me about the report and was also a key challenge for us is, is access to funds that are beyond the immediate startup phase. Um, so in the report, you refer to that as the valley of death. Um, so where you need investment to move from just yeah startup to actually scaling. And that's where so many enterprises, but a lot of social enterprises kind of fall through because they're unable to get that and they then they stagnate and then potentially they fail. Um and I often reflect on the fact that for us as a non-profit, there are really not as many investment and funding opportunities available as if one were a for-profit um, and, and had those so many different investment opportunities there. Um, so I think that that is a really big challenge. Um, and then fourthly, our own skill sets and knowledge. Um, so this kind of connects back a bit to the youth point. But, um, you know, we had experience of working for a social, an organization that did social good and in education. But this was the first time that we're doing something uh, like this. Uh, we are relatively young and have been working with a relatively young team. And there are areas of of that are quite um that are quite specific that you need to learn about and, and know about. Um, but I think it's, um, yeah, there were definitely gaps in our skill set and knowledge that, um, yeah, that have prevented us or have maybe slowed us down um, from reaching our goals as well. I think that's the most important part. Essentially, what we're trying to figure out is how can we unlock the potential of those youth-led social enterprises and make sure that they can shine, that they can scale, that they can advance all of the good and all of the impacts all the good that they're doing, all of the impact that they're making um, to an extent that that's reasonably feasible also for the founders. So uh, what we've seen in our research as well is that like in particular disadvantaged youth uh, fail, uh, face additional challenges that are linked to uh, additional lacks of skills in financial literacy, but also like digital literacy, access to tools, and then additional access to funds because they somehow for a lot of funders represent additional risk because there might be even less. So do you, what do you think? Does this align with your experiences of working with displaced youth with Amala or what do you think, Polly? I think, you know, disadvantaged youth will just find it harder to access resources um, more, more generally. Um, and I think um, digital literacy is a great example of this. Uh, there are a lot of the young people that we work with um, in, in both Kenya and Jordan who um, who have very, very limited IT skills, digital literacy skills. Um, and so some of them don't know how to turn on a computer, let alone use software and connect with others using online tools. Um, and we've actually been working on a whole course in the area of supporting digital literacy for, for entrepreneurship and innovation for that reason. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing I would mention is that networks play such a key role for social entrepreneurs. So we were lucky that we were able to draw upon our networks within education to make Amala what it is today. Um, we were able to draw on educators to help us to develop our curriculum, uh, finance specialists to help us with the model, uh, find donors with our networks, find lawyers to help with registration. Um, 
And so kind of a concern that I have is that a lot of the young people that we work with, Amala, who come from refugee backgrounds, don't have those networks. Um, and um, and this is something that we try to create through Amala, uh, but something that is that is vital to any kind of entrepreneurial success, really. It, 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 yeah, it's cliched, but it's true. I think that's it. It's cliched. You cannot do it alone, but that's it also to some extent. It's uh, very inspiring to hear that. Thanks for highlighting these challenges. I think for us, they're really a testament to you persevering there, but also to all of those young people that you've accompanied over the, the years, persevering in the face of adversity. And um, we already know from the research that we've done that fortunately there is already support available for many social entrepreneurs, many young social entrepreneurs. And in many countries, there are uh, support measures such as tailored capacity building support, uh, where they have customized guidance available. Uh, but we wanted to hear from you a little bit more as specifically as uh, a practitioner in this field, as a young social entrepreneur, uh, were there instances where you've received support from public authorities? And could you tell us how that has helped you unlock the potential of Amala? It's a really good question. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, actually, you know, we've had very limited or or, or no support from public authorities for Amala. Um, now, I don't think that that's because it doesn't exist. Uh, but um, we are we are registered in the UK, but we don't run programs in the UK. All of our programs are in different countries. Um, so I think that that um, that affects our experience here. Um but there's maybe an interesting point, which is that a kind of a lot of funds tend to focus on initiatives that are going to benefit the country where uh, where a social where where a social enterprise is, is started um, and is and is serving. And so, in our case, we fall a bit through the gaps. Um, but I have um, I have worked on other um, smaller initiatives in the past, and you know for that um, we've achieved funding from um, there are places like Unlimited, uh, which for example is a foundation that is government supported um, and helps social enterprises with their startup needs, including um, funding, mentoring, support with the with the business model, and all of those kind of things. Um, so they they do exist, but I think as an initiative working kind of across borders, uh, I would say it's been much harder or much more limited. It's interesting because I think for us, that's also what we've seen when we came across this, is that there is a somewhat a disconnect between what's available, who's it targeted to, and also like what do people know about it. So a part of the report that we have is also this annex that's really, really rich. Where we've tried to accumulate a lot of um, initiatives that uh, governments, but also social economy and social enterprises, social economy organizations, social enterprises are putting in place that can help uh, young social entrepreneurs uh, like first start up and then potentially also scale. And we've also come across some of the work that Unlimited has been doing in the past, including a report that they did on uh, youth-led social enterprise in a couple of European countries. So they've been a big inspiration, very exciting. Um, in our report, uh, we also recommend five initial areas in which policymakers can more broadly support young social entrepreneurs. And that includes uh, the encouragement of private investment and developing tailored funding and financing schemes for young social entrepreneurs and youth-led social enterprises, accompanied, of course, by clear guidance for the ones that are funding, but also for the social enterprises involved. A uh, second point is to raise the profile of social enterprises more broadly, not only youth-led social enterprises, but social enterprises more broadly, to be a beacon of the impact that they're having and understand that a little bit better and also carry that out there. Uh, that can happen through legal frameworks that can boost the recognition of social enterprises and youth-led social enterprises and also by funders and donors that potentially know better what it then means to have like this hybrid business model and uh, don't discard it uh, for similar reasons as, as you've described for your case. And then uh, there is the notion of like uh, improving the evidence base on youth-led social enterprises more broadly to understand how many are there, what are they doing, what impacts are they having. And I think one of the reasons we're here today is also to try and make that shine, to see that impact. And uh, finally, the idea is also to give young people a seat at the table so that their perspectives and needs are considered when policy frameworks and when any measures are being developed, uh, because they're the ones that know best and they are the ones that have faced those challenges, that are facing those challenges. And essentially, we want to make sure that we can we can try and help public authorities across OECD countries and beyond develop policies that are going to be helping to create better uh, outcomes for youth at social enterprises. What do you think, personally, from your experience and from what you've done with Amala, public authorities can do to support social entrepreneurs in the future? 
Yeah, so I think my my kind of uh, my two word answer is a lot. Um, uh, I think the the longer answer. I mean, I was I was really struck by um, by the data um, in your report that in OECD countries, nearly fifty percent of university students wanted to work on a business idea, but only five percent were were doing something. Um, and so, kind of viewing it through that lens, um, I think it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> um, and I think there are various ways that public authorities can support. Um, and I kind of wanted to start by thinking thinking just about like, what are the essential ingredients that are fundamental to making a social enterprise work? Um, so number one, you need to have a strong enough idea that can actually be implemented. Uh, and number two, you need to find the right people or the, the right person to work with to make it a reality. There, there, there are some people that do set things up on their own, but often you need a you need a strong core team or at least a co-founder. And number three is really finding the right network to to support um, to support that development of the of the idea. Um, and then, of course, you need to be able to test the concept and see if it works, if it's valid, build from there. So there's quite a lot of risk that is attached to all of this. Um, and I think many young people uh, may think, you know, what if I what if I quit my job or what if I pursue, try to pursue this and, and it fails? Um, so I think when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking, you know, a question for public authorities is how can they help to de-risk the process? I think there are a few areas, other areas where I think public funding could be used um, or could really be beneficial um, for, for social enterprises. And I think the first is in research and development. Um, and so this is usually where you know the organization is trying to develop a unique product or offering which can then produce commercial or can produce value in the future. Um, but this is the kind of area, and I think you pointed out in the report that a lot of a lot of social enterprises are initially very dependent on, say, grant funding or foundation funding. Um, and but that type of funding is usually for very specific implementable projects and doesn't allow the kind of research and development um, that one would that one would the funding that one would have access to do as, as a for profit. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting area for public authorities to look at funding for social enterprises because it will make them more um, financially sustainable in the future. So it's a really worthy investment. Um, and the second is in that kind of valley of death phase as well, where um, for profit models can much more easily leverage funding. Um, I'm, of course, a big believer in youth involvement and and voice. And I think, you know, policymakers need to um, to kind of to work really closely with youth and really closely with so social entrepreneurs. Um, a bit like what I'm telling you now to look at what are those pain points along the way. Um, I can't not speak about education. Um, I think that um, we need, and you point this out excellently in the report, um, we need much stronger, a much stronger kind of um, education provision around not just social entrepreneurship, but beyond that kind of innovation at all levels of the education system. And you've pointed out rightly, you know, both in formal and in non-formal education and, and a few final words about education. So I think, you know, the greatest change that we see in the young people that we work with when, who take our social entrepreneurship courses, they often go from thinking, I have to be rich to be an entrepreneur to, oh, wow, I can do something myself today in my community to improve it. I think that's uh, summing it up very, very nicely, more beautifully than we could have done in our report. Thank you so much, Polly. It's been incredible to see from you and hear from you what young social entrepreneurs are already accomplishing and also to make sure that we have, we're practicing what we're preaching, giving young social entrepreneurs a seat at the table and hearing from you what it is that you need and to be able to feed that in. Uh, let me just say a few short words regarding our work on youth-led social enterprises. Um, we have co-authored with James Hermanson and Amal Chevaux a recent report on uh, unlocking the potential of youth-led social enterprises. You've all heard a lot from Polly already about this here. Uh, we're part of a unit that has been working on social entrepreneurship and social enterprises at the OECD for over 25 years. And this summer, OECD countries have adopted two council recommendations that allow the OECD member countries and others to further shape their national, regional and local agendas on the social and solidarity economy and social innovation, as well as creating better opportunities for young to implement them. You can follow us on Twitter at OECD Local and please do stay tuned for the next production of our OECD podcasts. 
For those wishing to learn more about this publication or other OECD work on the social economy, feel free to use the links that we've included in the info box of this podcast. Thank you so much. To listen to other OECD podcasts, find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and soundcloud.com slash OECD.